Hey, this is Skippen. I just picked up the 12.9 inch 2021 or fifth generation iPad Pro and wanted to give my experience and thoughts using it as a digital artist for 24 hours. Seeing as even the 12.9 inch iPad is still very portable for a tablet of its size, I wanted to test it in my office and on the go to really get a feel for the form factor and how it performs in a variety of different situations. After installing my main apps and setting them up with my custom tools and workspaces, I started off on my day. Most days start with me getting on a train and with some free time and a little bit of luck getting a seat drawing on the train. I thought a good way to get started testing would be to jump right into a piece I was working on right up until the new iPad arrived. This piece was started off on the iPad mini 5, so while still being an iPad, these two devices are on opposite ends of the spectrum, so I thought it would make for a great comparison. Handhold drawing on the 12.9 inch iPad Pro can be a bit cumbersome but still possible on the Tokyo trains. It does feel like if it were any bigger though, you would start to invade other people's personal space. That's a bit more comfortable. Using the 12.9 inch iPad Pro as a portable sketchbook and drawing device seems feasible, but for a drawing like this, and especially for a professional grade app like Clip Studio Paint, I want to sit down, take my time, and use a keyboard. It can be difficult to find a nice quiet place to draw, especially on the weekend in a place like Akihabara, but I've managed to find a nice place to sit down and draw. The benefits over the iPad Mini 5 become very apparent when you do get to sit down. On the Mini 5, I often have to zoom in to draw fine details, but on the 12.9 inch Pro, you can still have a large view of your canvas while drawing fine details. The M1 chip handled my usual canvas, A4 350 DPI and over 60 layers, no problem. Not only that, the high pixel density and large screen make the A4 size canvas feel pretty small, and you quickly are viewing it at over 100%. So in an upcoming video, I'll try to tackle larger canvases and really see what the limitations are. After drawing a bit with Clip Studio Paint, I decided to test out Procreate. I was hoping that the more powerful M1 chip would allow for more layers, but unfortunately, an A4 size file at 350 dpi can only have a maximum of 18 layers. It might just be that Procreate is not yet optimized for the M1 chip, and a future update can help solve this, but at the moment it's very disappointing because Clip Studio Paint can run an A4 size file at 350 dpi and 60 layers blazing fast. That being said, Procreate is where I saw the benefits of one of the 12.9 inch iPad Pro's new exclusive features. This is a bit more difficult to show on video and may be a little bit subjective, but having the mini LED display made Procreate's already realistic pencil brushes feel that much more realistic with rich contrast to complement the natural brush engine. This, with the larger screen real estate, reminded me of larger sketchbooks I would use in school, where you could draw multiple thumbnails and plan out your next project. After all this filming and drawing, I was really curious to see what the GH5's roughly 5K footage would look like on LumaFusion, as well as its photos on Lightroom. 4K ran very smoothly, and 5K files were a bit choppy, but that is the case even on my workstation. I really have to test it out further with a proper video project, but it seems very promising, and I can see moving some of my workflow over to LumaFusion. Lightroom also worked very well as you would expect. Importing photos directly from a camera or SD card is fast and simple. All you need is a USB-C adapter. Applying a preset or a quick edit to multiple photos was surprisingly fast and easy. And I can definitely see myself using this workflow on the go for a job or project that demands a quick turnaround rather than perfection. I'm also curious to see if the mini LED display's color representation has any effect on my workflow. After that, I wanted to work a little bit more on the drawing I had started on Procreate. I ended up switching over to Clip Studio Paint and I streamed the whole line work process. During the stream, having that extra room to make long, unbroken strokes while still being able to see a majority of your canvas showed the strengths of having this larger screen on an iPad. I wanted to end this video with one often overlooked iPad feature that I feel is very prevalent, especially for artists. And I also wanted to explain a little bit why I purchased this very expensive tablet, even though I have several other very capable tablets. That overlooked feature is called Parallax, or in the iPad's case, the lack thereof. I often say the iPad is one of, if not the best drawing tablets on the market, in part because the Apple Pencil, whether it's the first or second generation, exhibits no noticeable parallax, and is one of the most accurate pens when it comes to tilt and pressure. It feels very realistic, and the Apple Pencil is the reason why I always recommend the iPad for those looking for a purely great drawing experience. I mention this because I recently reviewed the Lenovo Chromebook Duet, which if it were not for the parallax issue, it would be an excellent value machine, and the Surface line also suffers from this parallax issue. The iPad has its own flaws and limitations, but it's often outweighed by the excellent drawing and user experience. It's a premium product with a premium price tag, and they're typically a good investment, but I feel like that's about to change. You see, normally I recommend buying Apple products that are a few years old or buying something refurbished, but right now it seems like if you get something that doesn't have an M1 chip in it, you might be getting something that is phased out relatively quickly. Apple has always supported their devices with new updates to a certain extent, but they are also notorious for cutting support to older still working devices. It's a paradox that's very Apple specific. 
with the potential for the M1 not to just be an iPad or Mac chip, but something more universal that will be in more devices in the future, it's almost a guarantee that Apple will focus on support and updates for the new chipset. That isn't to say that those with the 2018 iPad Pro should immediately run out and buy the 2021 version. There hasn't been really anything even promised yet for the M1 chips as far as like cross-platform between Mac OS and iPad OS, but it is a possibility now that different devices are running on the same architecture. My general rule with Apple products is to buy the best thing that you can in the moment when you need it and only when you need it. So right now, if you have something that's working for you, you don't have to run out and get this. But if you're looking for something, I think the 2021 iPad Pro and more specifically the 12.9 inch version is gonna have the most longevity. We'll have to see what the M1 chip means for iPad OS and iPads in general, but for right now, I'm gonna to continue to test the 2021 12.9 inch iPad Pro and get back with a proper review video as soon as I can. I'm Skip N and thank you so much for watching.